morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our online talk this morning. For those who are here early, thank you for waiting patiently. Our talk will be starting shortly. In the meantime, we'll share with you a short video from our firm. I founded the firm in September 1985 with the vision of seeking truth and justice for our clients and not just winning their cases. Over the years, the team has achieved many significant milestones. We are today recognized by the Legal 500, Asia Law Profiles, and Asian Legal Business as a recommended firm in various practice areas. While we have embraced technology to make our services efficient and responsive, we continue to grow on a bedrock of meticulous preparation and hard work, for which there is really no substitute. As legal practice becomes increasingly international, we keep ourselves ahead of the curve with our relationship with lawyers from around the world. Our firm is a founding member of the League of Lawyers, a growing international network of law firms in 20 Asian and European countries. We believe in partnering with our clients to protect and grow their business. We achieve this by holding firm to our values of integrity and justice while giving our best to deliver effective and efficient solutions. Instead of just legal services, we focus on developing great working relationships based on understanding and respect. The firm invests in its team and emphasizes professional development. We are keen to share our knowledge and publish our articles on our website and we also give back with our corporate social responsibility activities. We cultivate a passion for the law and enjoy what we do. This brings out the best in us for our clients today and tomorrow. We regularly advise foreign clients, including many Chinese investors, and have a ready appreciation for different ways of doing business. In corporate matters, we offer relevant and commercial solutions, often raising issues that clients may or may not have realized before. In negotiations, we believe in facilitating win-win outcomes. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our online talk today entitled Citizenship for Adopted Children and Stateless Individuals. My name is Vivian Fan. I'm an associate from Mao Kwan Associates, and I'll be a moderator for today's session. Before we start today's talk, allow me to introduce to you our firm and what we do. Mao Kwan Associates is a mid-sized law firm, which was founded in 1985 by our Datuk Ma Huing Datuk Ma is the consultant with the firm following his retirement from the Court of Appeal bench in 2015. Our ABLE team comprises of 22 lawyers and a support team of 19. The firm continues its tradition today of working primarily with, medium, with small medium enterprises, family businesses, and individuals. We're a full service law firm with four departments, namely the corporate department, the dispute resolution department, including litigation, adjudication, and arbitration, and industrial relations team, and a department focused on servicing the needs of individuals and families. Our firm has five practice groups, and these practice groups indicate some of our focus areas, which are supported by talents from both our corporate and dispute resolution teams. Today's talk is part of our MWK online talk series. By way of background, we have been organizing monthly lunch talks at our office since 2013, some of which were also broadcasted live. But now with a movement control order, or we call it MCO, we have moved online in order to continue with our objective of sharing knowledge with you, raising awareness and encouraging networking among our clients, potential clients and in-house counsel. This is our eighth talk in our online talk series, which has been attended by some around 256 attendees on Monday. Today, we're expecting about 150 people who have registered online. Please visit our website at www mahuengkwai.com for more information, to read our articles, and to sign up for more upcoming talks. Now allow me to introduce both our speakers today, Mr. Eric Toh and Ms. Jasmine Wong, before I hand over the floor to them. Our first speaker is Eric Toh. He graduated, he graduated with a Bachelor of Laws 
from Australian National University, ANU, and he was admitted to the Malaysian Bar in 2018. Our second speaker is Ms. Jasmine Wong. Jasmine is an associate in our dispute resolution department. She graduated with a Bachelor of from Aberystwyth University and was called to the Malaysian Bar in 2017. Both our Eric and Jasmine were involved in the 2019 Federal Court Appeals on Stateless and Adopted Children and were recently specially invited to speak at the LexisNexis Rule of Law Cafe Roundtable Discussion and National Expert Consultations NEC on Nationality, Statelessness and Citizenship and Jasmine herself at the MCCHR's Undi Malaysia chat. Our speakers target to complete their presentation by 11.45 a.m. and then they will take questions from you thereafter. Our speakers will be touching on six top points this morning, which are how does statelessness arise, the relevant provisions in the federal constitution in relation to citizenship, the relevant provisions in the legislations relating to our talk today, which is the Adoption Act 1952, the Legitimacy Act 1961, and the cases decided by the court. Before we start, there are a few housekeeping rules which we would appreciate if you could follow. Number one, kindly mute yourself throughout the presentation to avoid any unnecessary interruption. Number two, if you have any questions, please don't forget to post them on Slido. You can access the Slido page by scanning the QR code in front of its screen right now or going to the website at the bottom left corner and key in the number 98350. You should have received a link to Slido during your registration, but I will leave the slide up for a while so you can scan it before we move on. We will attend to your questions at the end once our speakers are done with their presentation. With that said, I will now leave the floor to our first speaker, Eric, who will, be, who will enlighten us with how statelessness arrives. Eric, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Vivian, for the introductions. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, for join, thank you again for joining us today on this lovely Friday morning. So without further ado, I think I'll jump straight into the talk today as there are quite a few grounds for us to cover. So how does statelessness arise in Malaysia? So in the course of our work, we have found that there are actually three main scenarios where this happens. And there are others, but the three main ones are, number one, when individuals are born in Malaysia to biological parents who are not known. Number two, individuals who are born in Malaysia to a Malaysian father and a non-Malaysian mother who are not married to one another. And thirdly, individuals who are born outside of Malaysia to a Malaysian mother and a non-Malaysian father, but who are married to each other. So what happens when you are a Malaysian or a non-Malaysian? What kind of birth certificates do you get? So if you look to the left of the screen, the green birth certificate is for Malaysian citizens, children who are Malaysians. And you can see the Wagan Nagara at the middle left corner, middle left of the birth certificate. For stateless or non-citizens, you will get the pink birth certificate. And this dual color scheme was introduced by JPN back in 2011 to distinguish between non-citizens and citizens. And if you look at the red or pink birth certificate, you can see that there is not only one instance whereby the word Bukan Wagan Negara is stated. Someone had the idea that they were worried that maybe you, you cannot differentiate who is Wagan Negara and Bukan Wagan Negara just by the red color and one time of Bukan Wagan Negara. So they included another big Bukan Wagan Negara word at the top left corner of the red birth certificate. So how do we get this coveted green birth certificate, uh, which states that we are Wagan Negara? Basically, you can get it if you obtain citizenship by operation of law under Article 14 of the Federal Constitution. There are other methods to get citizenship, mainly by registration, naturalization, and incorporation of territory, which are stated in those articles in the slide. But for today, we will mainly talk about citizenship by operation of law under Article 14 of the Constitution. So the first ground that a person can get citizenship by operation of law is by being born to a Malaysian parent or Malaysian parents. 
Article 14, sub 1, sub B of the Constitution says that every person who is born on or after Malaysia Day and having the qualifications specified in Part 2 of the second schedule of the Constitution are citizens by way of operation of law, which in other words, by right. So Section 1A of the second schedule says that you must be born within the Federation and at least one of your parents is a Malaysian citizen or a PR at the time of your birth. So to summarize, there are three categories or three requirements. Number one, you must be born on after Malaysia Day. Number two, you must be born within the Federation or within Malaysia. And number three, one of your parents at the time of your birth must be a Malaysian citizen or a PR. Then it begs the question, what do you mean by parents? What does parents mean in Section 1A of the second schedule? And for adopted children, does the post-adoption birth certificate pursuant to an adoption order, is it a conclusive evidence of the identity of the child's parents? So also, does an adoption order automatically confer citizenship by way of operation of law? For that, we have to look at Section 9 and Section 25A of the Adoption Act read together with the Constitution. We have reproduced Section 9 here. It is quite a lengthy section, but to summarize, it means that once you are adopted by someone or Malaysians, your, the adopted child is deemed to be a child born in lawful wedlock to the adopter. In other words, if you adopt someone, then the, ch the child would be deemed to have been born to you and your spouse in lawful wedlock while you were married. And if you have seen earlier, there's actually no express reference in Section 9 to a rights of a citizenship. So it doesn't say that once you're adopted, you get your parents' citizenship. But we believe a purposive or beneficial approach should be taken to interpret Section 9 to include the rights of citizenship. We can also look at Section 25A of the Adoption Act. And Section 25A says that once you obtain an adoption order, you have to surrender your original birth certificate, the old one, to JPN to be cancelled. And then JPN will issue a new birth certificate to you, which will be a new official birth certificate, and the contents will be conclusive proof of the facts and particulars relating to your birth. In English, this means that once you're adopted, people can only refer to your new birth certificate to determine the facts and particulars of your birth. Basically, to determine the time of your birth, the place of your birth, your name, and importantly for our situation, who are your parents? Because in a post-adoption birth certificate, your adoptive parents' name will be inserted instead of your original parents, if any. Section 25A also says that you cannot, or JPN cannot include the words adopted, adopter, adoptive, or any other like words of, uh, words of like effect in the new birth certificate. And why, why is the rationale for this? So Parliament said when they were trying to amend Section 25A to include Section 25A in Adoption Act, said that they wanted to include that to prevent the possibility that knowledge of the fact that a child was adopted would have adverse psychological effects on the adopted child because they may be unprepared to learn of the background and status. So I think that is a good rationale, good idea. But if you think about it, yes, you do not put the words adopted, adoptive, or adopter in the new birth certificate. But on the other hand, you have a new birth certificate, which is red or pink, and you have two Bukan Wagenagara words on the new birth certificate. So for children who see that they have these different birth certificates, would they, wouldn't that also affect them uh, no, affect them in an adverse way, their mental health or psychological health, because they may ask questions like if they have siblings or if their adoptive parents have other children, they may say, why does my brother or sister have a different birth certificate to mine? Why are theirs green and mine red? And I have the Bukan Wagen Nagara words. So that is something to think about in terms of whether having this red birth certificate issued is still uh, a good 
thing for the child. Now we look at how the courts have interpreted the word parents in the constitution. So in the case of Pandafta Bursa Kelahiran and Kematian and PWS, which is a Court of Appeal case, the Court of Appeal actually held that parents refer to biological parents only. And the Court of Appeal said that if the constitution wanted to, intended to include adoptive parents as a category, then they would have expressly provided so. However, there is a differing opinion by another Court of Appeal panel in Madhubita Janjara Augustine, whereby the court there said that actually the word parents is not qualified or restricted in any way. So the court held that the words are not qualified by the other words like lawful, biological, adopted, surrogate, or any other words. It, it simply just means parents. So when, if the constitution does not restrict it, the court has said that it is not appropriate for them to qualify it themselves or restrict the words. Hence, then the Court of Appeal said that the parents should just mean it's ordinary common sense, meaning your father, your mother, your dad, your daddy, your mommy. So those are your parents. On our part, our firm actually had a couple of successful cases whereby we obtained citizenship for a child. But this was before the disputes as to the what does the word parent mean. So in the case of LCP, the child's biological parents were unknown and the child was adopted by a Malaysian couple. But after the child was adopted, a new birth certificate was issued to the child whereby it says that the child is a PR instead of a citizen. So the parents then applied for a judicial review of JPN's decision to re to register the child as a PR. So the court in looking at that judicial review application agreed with us and said that once a child is adopted by a Malaysian couple, then the child should be a Malaysian citizen. So the court held that the child was a citizen of Malaysia by operation of law by virtue of number one, his birth in Malaysia and number two, by his legal adoption. So the born in Malaysia ground will be talked, uh, will be explained by my colleague Jasmine later. We also, so also fortunately at the time, the government did not see it fit to appeal against this order by the High Court. But I think if it happens again today in this climate, I think the court, uh, the government may, may want to appeal against that. Further information about that case and and more explanation on the section can be seen in an article written by our managing partner, Mr. Raymond Ma, titled Citizenship for Adopted Child, a Malaysian Perspective, which can be found in the Malayan Law Journal. And if you Google, you can also see the article. Another case which we got citizenship for the child is the case of PWS. But this was at the high court level. Similarly, the child's biological parents were unknown and the child was adopted by a Malaysian couple. And the court held that even though you don't know who, is, who are the biological parents of the child, the child's status changed once an adoption order was granted by the High Court. And the High Court agreed with us and adopted our arguments uh, regarding Section 9 and Section 25A of the Adoption Act and held that the child is a Malaysian citizen by way of operation of law under Section 1A. But we look forward to any ruling by the federal court as to what the term parent means. Another subset, another category of uh, citizenship issues is where a person is having legitimacy issues. So, for example, can a person born in Malaysia who has been legitimized obtain Malaysian citizenship? If you look at Section 17 of part two of the second schedule of the federal constitution, it says that for the purposes of citizenship, any references to an illegitimate person's father or parent will be construed as references to his mother. But okay, so what does that mean? Let me give you an illustration. Here we have Mr. Ree. Mr. Ree is a Malaysian father. 
And he has a girlfriend, a Korean girlfriend, Miss Yoon. And Mr. Ri and Miss Yoon are not married. And in time, they were blessed with a child, baby Hyun, and vowed they were not married. So Mr. Ri and Miss Yoon then brought baby Hyun to JPN, or to register baby Hyun's birth in JPN. So you think there's no issue. Mr. Ri is a Malaysian. These are biological parents of the child. Shouldn't baby Hyun get Malaysian citizenship? But if what happens is, if she goes to JPN, baby Hume will get a pink birth certificate with the two Bukan Vagunagara words. And why is that so? It's because of the operation of section 17 of the constitution of part three of section schedule. And that basically says that since Mr. Ri and Ms. Yoon are not married, baby Hume's citizenship will only be following the mother's citizenship, which is Miss Yoon's citizenship. So Mr. Ri's Malaysian citizenship does not uh, play, does not come to play here. And hence, baby Hyun will not be a Malaysian. So what can they do? What, what can Mr. Ri and Miss Yoon do to solve this situation that they are having? Actually, the solution is simple or relatively simple, they just need to get married. Because under the Legitimacy Act, a person will be rendered legitimate from the date of his or her parents' marriage. So in this case, once Mr. Ri and Miss Yoon get married, then baby Hyun's birth will be legitimized and baby Hyun will be a legitimate child. But of course, there are other restrictions where, whereby the marriage must be a valid marriage under Malaysian law. And the Legitimacy Act is only applicable to non-Muslims. So Muslims cannot rely on this uh, legislation. A real-life example of how this worked was in the case of Madhubita Janjara, Augustine, in a court of appeal. And in that case, the child was born before the subsequent marriage of her parents. Again, a Malaysian father and a PNG, a foreign citizenship mother. And the Court of Appeal held that the child was a Malaysian pursuant to Section 1A and also Section 1E of the Constitution because of the subsequent marriage of her parents. And in the course of finding that, the, the court made some observations and findings, and they say that even if the term parents is qualified by the term lawful, they find it difficult to see how the natural or biological parents of a person can ever be said to be not lawful. Secondly, they find that just because the child's biological parents were not married does not alter or diminish their capacities as parents of the appellant or the child. And they found that because Section, 7, Section 17 does not apply because it only applies to a person who is illegitimate, so back to my example, if baby Hyun, uh, after baby Hyun got the pink birth certificate and then straight away, Mr. Ri and Ms. Hyun went to court to apply for citizenship, they would probably not be successful because at that time, baby Hyun is still an illegitimate child. However, if after Mr. Ri and Ms. Hyun get married, then they apply to court for citizenship for baby Hyun. And it's more likely that baby Hyun will be able to get the citizenship because then at the time, baby Hyun will not be illegitimate anymore. He will be a legitimate child. So paragraph 65 and 66 are basically what I stated earlier. And importantly, the court said that as a legitimate person, the appellant, who is the child, can now entit is entitled to rely on her father's citizenship. And therefore, the appellant has clearly fulfilled the requirement of Section 1A, which requires a person to have a Malaysian parent. So to summarize that, basically, for people who have legitimacy issues, number one, you need to legitimize your child's birth after we are marriage. So if you had a child before you got married, Get married, legitimize child's birth. But 
Also, you must bear in mind that you cannot, the Malaysian father cannot simply marry anyone. Yeah? Must marry the biological mother. Okay? And then after you do so, you can apply to court for citizenship following the Madhu Vita's decision. Okay, that is all for me today. I will pass the floor to my colleague Jasmine, who will talk about the Born in Malaysia ground. Over to you, Jasmine. Thank you, Eric. So to recap, a person is a citizen by operation of law if the child is born in Malaysia and one of his parents is at the time of the child's birth a Malaysian citizen or a permanent resident in Malaysia. Another criteria provided by the federal constitution to be a citizen by operation of law is section 1E of the second schedule in the federal constitution where the person is born in Malaysia and not born a citizen of any other country. As you can see on the slide, Section 1E of Second Schedule says not born a citizen of any other country otherwise than by virtue of this paragraph. This definition, this phrase is being defined by Section 2 sub 3 which says that a person is to be treated as having at birth any citizenship which he acquires within one year afterwards. So what it means is if you are born in Malaysia and you do not get uh, Malaysian citizenship or any other country citizenship within one year from your date of birth, you are deemed not having, uh, not born a citizen of any other country. This section 1 sub E is a catch-all provision intended to overcome the problem of statelessness among children born in Malaysia. But the issue that arises is, the question arises as to whether the identity and citizenship of the person's biological parents is relevant in the determination of citizenship, whether we need to identify um, who the biological parents are and whether they are Malaysian or not before you are qualified for citizenship under Section 1 sub E. The reason why we have this question is because we have conflicting decisions in the Malaysian courts. Let's start with the case of LCP back in 2010, which Eric has mentioned earlier. If you recall, the child was born uh, was abandoned at birth and we do not know who the biological parents are. The child was then subsequently adopted by Malaysian citizens. Um, but because of, even though he has already been adopted by Malaysian citizens, the child is still registered as a non-citizen on his birth certificate. But the details of his place of birth, which is in Malaysia, is registered and stated accordingly on the adoption uh, on the post adoption birth certificate even after he has gotten his uh, the adoption order and the new birth certificate so by that the respondent had already accepted the fact that this child was born in malaysia it is also not disputed that he did not acquire any citizenship of any other country within one year of uh, from his date of birth the fact that the child was born stateless and from the day of his birth, he remained stateless and did not acquire citizenship of any other country was also not disputed by the respondent, which is the JPN in this case. In LCP's case, and in this case, LPK against, uh, and another against Pendaftar Besar Klariheran dan Kematian Malaysia, both the, court held, both the High Court held that the children in these two cases are Malaysian citizens pursuant to their days of birth in Malaysia, which correspond with Section 1, Sub E of the second schedule. In LPK's case as well, the children, there were two children in this case. They were born in Malaysia, but their biological parents were unknown and untraceable. Justice Asmabi held that the children are Malaysian citizens pursuant to their place of birth, which the details is stated accordingly on their birth certificate. In LPK's case, which we represented uh, the parents and the children, we submitted to the court that it is unreasonable to impose on the applicants the burden of identifying the children's birth mother, especially when we do not know the identity and the citizenship status of the children's birth mother. On top of the fact, we also submitted that this detail is irrelevant to the children's citizenship. If you were to look at the provisions and the wordings of Section 1E and Section 2 sub 3, there is nowhere in those two provisions which say that you need to identify your um, the person's birth mother or the, any one of the parents before you qualify for citizenship. This is not the same as Section 1 sub A as uh, uh, explained by Eric earlier. 
So what it means is you only need to show that you were born in Malaysia and you do not you did not acquire any citizenship of any other country within one year from your place of uh, from your date of birth. These are merely the two requirements in section one sub e. In 2016, again, in the High Court, we submitted the same arguments in PWS, uh, which also has already been explained by Eric earlier. In that case, the child was abandoned at birth, he was born in Malaysia, and we do not know who are the biological parents, whether they are Malaysian or whether they are permanent resident or not. These facts, these, um, these particular details are not known to anybody. So the court um, here, Justice Yazid, in the High Court, he held that the child is a citizen under Section 1 sub E pursuant to his date of birth, uh, place of birth. He agreed with our submissions, and in support of his decision, uh, Justice Yazid referred to the decisions in LCP and LPK earlier, which have similar facts. Biological parents were unknown, uh, were not traceable, and the fact that they were born in Malaysia, and this is also again not disputed by the, um, by the JPN. But the courts took a different approach in the case of Lin Jensen and another against Ketua Pengarah JPN. Here the facts differ a little bit. The child was born in Malaysia, but to a Malaysian father and a Thai mother out of wedlock. So that means the child is an illegitimate child. In applying for a declaration that the child is a Malaysian citizen, they rely on the fact that the child was born in Malaysia pursuant to Section 1 sub E. But the Court of Appeal held that Section 1 sub E requires the uh, requirement of um, blood lineage, which is a principle called juice sanguine, which therefore it means that you need to identify the child's biological mother or biological father if they are married. Before, you, before the child is entitled to be a citizen by operation of law under Section 1 sub e. So in this case, because the child is born to a Thai mother, the child is deemed to uh, acquire the uh, Thai citizenship pursuant to Section 17 of the Federal Constitution. And in this case, the courts say that the child is not a Malaysian citizen by operation of law. Paragraph 40 in this case, in the grounds of judgment, it states that due to the illegitimate status, he acquires the citizenship of his biological mother. And because of that, he is not a person who is not born a citizen of any other country. The Court of Appeal in Tan Siu Beng and another took the similar decision, had the similar, similar decision with Lim Jensen. The facts of Tan Siu Beng is slightly, is sim, quite similar to LCP, um, PWS, and uh, um, LPK's case. The adoptive parents are Malaysian. The citizenship of the biological parents are unknown. The identity is unknown as well. So in this case, adoptive parents rely on the fact that the child is a Malaysian citizen by virtue of his birth, which is again stated on the child's birth certificate. But the Court of Appeal say that Section 1 sub e refers to the relationship of the child to his biological and lawful parents at the time of his birth. And because the child was abandoned at birth, the identity of the child's lawful and biological parents are unknown. It is not possible to determine the lineage of the second uh, of the child that would require and um, give him the citizenship by operation of law under Section 1 sub e. They put the requirement of just sanguine in Section 1 sub e. In paragraph 38, the Court of Appeal say that the absence of particulars on the child's birth certificate in respect of his lineage can be construed as sufficient proof, cannot be construed as sufficient proof that the child was not born a citizen of any other country. If you were to peruse the grounds of judgment in uh, the Court of Appeal's judgment in Lim Jensen's case and in Tan Siu Beng's case, you will notice that the Court of Appeal did not make any reference to the provision of Section 2 sub 3, which says that you must not acquire any other citizenship of any other country within one year um, to qualify under Section 1 sub e. By that, so it could be construed that the Court of Appeal has strongly attributed the requirement of identifying the identity and citizenship of the biological parents before you are entitled to Section 1 sub e. But luckily for the children, 
In the case of Madhuita Janjara Augustine in 2018, the Court of Appeal took a different approach. They say that because the child's birth was not registered in Papua New Guinea, and the fact that it was registered here and shown on the birth certificate, it is sufficient proof that the child is born in Malaysia and did not acquire citizenship of any other country within one year. The Court of Appeal also held that if the declaration for citizenship sought is not given, the child would not be a, the result of that would be the child is not a citizen of Malaysia. And as a result, consequently, she would be stateless. That cannot be said to be in the best interest and welfare of the child. A very recent case in the High Court, Wong Kwen Kwe against Government of Malaysia. Here, the applicant was born in Sabah, in Malaysia, to a Sarawakian father and a mother who is believed to be an Indonesian. The parents were not lawfully married. There are no evidence of marriage. And because of the lack of evidence of marriage, the applicant was registered as a non-citizen on his birth certificate. He then filed a judicial review application for a declaration of citizenship under Section 1 sub E, pursuant to his place of birth in Malaysia. The High Court agreed with the applicant and based on the decision of Madhubita Janjara Augustine, the High Court said and find that the applicant was born in Malaysia and he had resided in Malaysia his entire life. There is no evidence that he is a citizen of any other country. These details are accordingly shown on the applicant's birth certificate. And this birth certificate, which was issued by the Malaysian government, is conclusive. The fact is also that he is not a citizen of any other country when the applicant has returned to the Indonesian embassy to obtain confirmation of his status as an Indonesian citizen. The Indonesian embassy wrote back to say that there are no details found in their database. So as you can see, there are now conflicting decisions on the interpretation of Section 1 sub E of the Federal Constitution. Before I move on to the registration provisions, which would be a recourse for these individuals, I would like to briefly touch on the issue of gender inequality for children born in Malaysia. Born outside of Malaysia, sorry. Individuals who are born outside of Malaysia will fall under Section 1B of the Second Schedule or Section 1 sub C of the Second Schedule, which says that you are a citizen by operation of law if you are born in Malaysia and at the time of your birth, your father is a citizen citizen of Malaysia. The issue then arises as to whether Section 1B and Section 1C are in violation of the principle of gender, in, uh, gender equality in Article 8 sub 2 of our Federal Constitution. Article 8 sub 2 says that there shall be no discrimination against citizens on the ground of religion, race, descent, place of birth, or gender. We acceded to the Convention, convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, or commonly known as CEDAW, in 1995. And because of our that obligation, the word gender is added to Article 8 sub 2 in compliance with CEDAW. What it effectively means is that, pursuant to Article 9 sub 2 of CEDAW, state parties, which is Malaysia, among one of them, shall grant women equal rights with men with respect to the nationality of their children. But the problem is, Malaysia maintained reservation to this Article 9 sub 2 of CEDAW on the basis that this provision is not in line with the provision in our federal constitution, which is Section 1B and 1C of uh, the second schedule. So what happens to children born overseas to Malaysian women and their father is a foreigner? Malaysian women have to put in an application to register their child as a Malaysian citizen. This is not citizenship by operation of law. If the child is born overseas to a Malaysian father, all the father needs to do is to put in um, an application, it will be processed, and the child will be automatically a Malaysian citizen by operation of law within, um, within a couple of months. But this is not the case for children born outside of Malaysia to Malaysian women. So what options do they have? 
for those who are born overseas to Malaysian women or for those born in Malaysia whose their citizen, citizenship status is non-citizen or undetermined. They have to fall back to this registration provision under Article 15 sub 2 or Article 15A. What Article 15 sub 2 says is, it empowers the government to register anyone under the age of 21 and if your parents want at least is a citizen and you will be registered as a citizen. Similarly, in Article 15A, the federal government has special powers to register children under the age of 21 to be a citizen. And the criteria for this is such special circumstances. Unfortunately, there are no guidelines given by the Ministry of Home Affairs or the JPN on what constitutes special circumstances. The sole discretion lies with the Minister of the Home Affairs. Such an application, we have heard, it would take up to two years or a maximum of five years or even longer for the Ministry to review your application. And then subsequently, and most of the time, you will receive a rejection letter without reasons. Such process would be, uh, is arbitrary and not transparent because we do not know on what grounds your application is rejected. Children who apply under this uh, provision will eventually reach the age of 21 and they will subsequently be excluded from this registration provision. Unfortunately, this is our law right now and we definitely need legal reforms before um, to allow and recognize the right to citizenship by individuals born uh, in Malaysia and outside to Malaysia as long as one of your parents is a Malaysian. I will now move on to the legal process. How do we seek for a declaration of citizenship from the court? Such an application is made to the High Court by way of the first method, judicial review. It has to be filed within three months from the date when the grounds of application first arose or when the decision is first communicated to the applicant. So in the case of an abandoned child who was subsequently adopted uh, by the Malaysian citizens under the Adoption Act, what happens is after you have uh, obtained the adoption order from court, you submit the adoption order to JPN and they will process and reissue you with a new birth certificate. The time starts when you receive that new birth certificate and you have three months to file an application for judicial review. Your application must be supported with a statement stating out the particulars of your parents, the relief sought and the ground on which the reliefs are sought together with an affidavit uh, in support verifying the facts. This judicial review application is, um, it has several criteria where you must show a prima facie case you have to tell the court that your application is not frivolous or vexatious and there are substantial grounds supporting the application for judicial review. And then after you have gotten leave for judicial review, hearing of the judicial review proper will take place once leave for judicial review is granted. Another method is application by way of originating summons. Unlike judicial review application, you can file this application at any time it doesn't require to file within the three months period. Similarly to judicial review application as well, you need to support your originating summons with an affidavit, verifying the facts relied on, stating the relief sought, and in this case, it will be declaration for citizenship under section one sub A or section one sub E, and the grounds on which you are seeking for that declaration. That will be all from me, thank you. Thank you, Eric and Jasmine, for sharing with us today. We'll now take the questions that some of you have posted on Slido. For those of you who have missed our earlier slide, you can go to slido.com, if you can see in front of your screen, left-hand corner at the bottom, and key in the number 98350. I will now show the questions for all of you to see. First question is, if one parent is a foreigner and they are not married, the child will be stateless. stateless. Doesn't matter, father, mother or father. Is this still the case, Eric? Yes, so as I explained earlier, if it depends on whether the parent, the foreign parent is a mother or a father. So actually, if the 
mother is a Malaysian, then there shouldn't be an issue if as long as the child is born in Malaysia because the citizenship of the child will follow the mother's citizenship. But if the child is, uh, sorry, if the uh, foreign parent is uh, Malaysian and the foreign, sorry, if the foreign parent is uh, the mother, then you will have the uh, mystery and misuse situation. So they will have to get married and legitimize the child's birth. Thank you, Eric. Next question we have. If a pendatang tanpa izin, which means an uh, illegal immigrant, holds a, an IMM 13 certificate, marries a Malaysian citizen, do the children acquire automatic citizenship? Jasmine? The child will be a Malaysian citizen by operation of law if the marriage is already registered at the time of birth. IMM 13 certificate is merely an immigration pass. It doesn't give you the right to citizenship. So if you marry, um, you, your wife is a Malaysian citizen and the child is born uh, during the time of your marriage, then your child will be a Malaysian citizen by operation of law. I see. Thank you, Jasmine. Next question we have here. Is there any difference in granting citizenship to such children between a male illegal immigrant, pedatang tanpa izin, marrying a female Malaysian and a female illegal immigrant marrying a male Malaysian? Eric, can you assist us on this? Yes, as long as the child is born in Malaysia, then it doesn't matter whether you know, it's a male PTI marrying a female Malaysian or vice versa, because as long as one of the parents is a Malaysian and you were born in Malaysia, then you will get Malaysian citizenship. So there's no difference to answer the question. Thank you. Okay, next we have... KDN have set up a special task force to look into stateless children issues. Is anyone engaging with them? Jasmine? Last year, Eric and I were involved with a project where um, local and international experts reviewed the current human rights law in Malaysia. And the issue of citizenship was one of it. Uh, we drafted the amendments to the federal constitution on the issue of citizenship. We prepared the amended, uh, amendment bill and hopefully the plan was to table it um, well, the plan was to table it before Parliament beginning of this year, but given that the change in government, I think this project may be delayed now. We have a next question. I just got a legitimacy order for my child. Can I apply to JPN under Article 15.2 for my child's citizenship or should I go to court? Is it correct to use Article 15.2? Eric? Yeah, I'll take that. So I think since you say you have a legitimacy order means the child is your biological child and with your, your spouse. So as I explained earlier during the, my legitimacy section, I think it's better and it's, it may be faster for you to go to court based on the legitimacy order to apply for citizenship under Article 14, which is citizenship by operation of law. So that would be, a, I think, it's a better option for you. Thank you, Eric. Next we have... What are the ideal reforms to the issues of, number one, children born out of wedlock to Malaysian men, and two, children born overseas to Malaysian women? I think the ideal reform here would be to eliminate the distinction between um, children born to Malaysian men or women. It doesn't matter. It should, there shouldn't be a distinction between father and mother. As long as one of your parents is a Malaysian, the ideal situation is you are entitled to that citizenship pursuant to either one of your parents' citizenship. Thank you, Jasmine. Next we have, can you clarify this? Citizenship must be applied through courts. Yes, I'll take that. So, well, no, not, not exactly. Citizenship does not have to be applied through courts. And in fact, certain citizenships cannot be applied through courts. But for example, if you're going through citizenship by operation of law, then yes, you can apply through courts. But I think uh, Jasmine also mentioned earlier, there are a couple of other methods where you can get citizenship via reg registration. So those are Article 15 and Article 15A. And those citizenship applications can be done through JPN. But it, then JPN, there may be a waiting time for the citizenship uh, applications to be processed. Okay, next we have here, mother is an Indonesian, father is a Malaysian, but 
he himself is married, but not to the Indonesian. I believe they are not married to each other and they all have a child together. So the question is, um, what is the citizenship of the child? Yeah, so pursuant to section 17, which governs, uh, which is the provision for illegitimate children, uh, because the Indonesian mother and the Malaysian father, they are not married to each other at the time of the child's birth, the child would, would follow the citizenship of the mother, which is Indonesian. If the child was informally adopted and was issued with a birth certificate and a passport, I believe a Malaysian birth certificate and a passport, would an adoption order remedy this, Eric? Okay. How when, when informally adopted and then you get a birth certificate? I mean, I've heard, we, we have seen situations of that. But the, the problem with this is when your child reaches the age of 12 and then you apply for IC, then if there are any difference in the appearance of your child and yourself or your spouse, then JPN might flag the case and say, mm, maybe there's some problems there. And then what we usually see is uh, they will do some investigation. And if, the, if they find that the, the adoption was not formalized, then yes, they would uh, take back the birth certificate and issue the child with another birth certificate and usually it will be read. So yes, what happens after that is you can apply for an adoption order to, to formalize the adoption, but just be just keep in mind that even after your adoption, you may still get a red birth certificate. Your child still may still get a red birth certificate because depending on who the biological parents are, or if you know who the biological parents are, then the issues of, you know, as uh, I was talking about just now, whether who is a parent of the child would come into play. Yeah, and if, you can, if I can interject uh, and on to what Eric has said, um, sometimes JPN, they flag your case also not because of the physical appearance between the parents and the adopted child, but also because they already have a list of blacklisted clinics and hospitals. So if they see on the birth certificate that a child, the child is born at a certain, on a blacklisted hospital, that would also require an investigation on their part. Unfortunately, we don't have this list of which places are blacklisted, but we've only seen from cases that um, this place is a recurring, uh, recurring place, place of birth. And if the child is born in this particular medical center or hospital, um, that will naturally invite the JPN to start an investigation. Thank you, Jasmine. Next, we have, I'm turning 21 this June and I'm still waiting for approval for my Article 15A application. What if it is rejected and I'm over 21 years old? What are my options? It will most likely, your, your Article 15A application will most likely be rejected and you will then be forced, um, you are then required to file an application, uh, put in an application to JPN under Article 19 for naturalization. This has uh, more stringent requirements because the federal con uh, constitution says you need to show that you are fluent in Bahasa Malaysia. Uh, you need to stay in Malaysia for a minimum of 10 years and you need to have good character. Um, unfortunately, again, we don't have any guidelines on what constitutes good character. What we've heard from uh, other applicants is that for BM, uh, for, the, for the requirement to show that you are fluent in Bahasa Malaysia, you need to sit um, a test where you need to write an essay, uh, which is of a SPM standard. Thank you, Jasmine. Next, we have, how do stateless children prove that they are not born a citizen of another country. Eric? Yes, so this, the, the courts have also imposed uh, certain, I think they the requirements of how to prove, uh, but I think they will want you to try to find out who your biological parents are. Perhaps one way to show that you are not a citizen of any other country, it's unfortunately, is maybe to Right, if you know who the biological parents are, and you know maybe the parents are, uh, let's say Thai, then maybe you can write to the Thai embassy to just make an inquiry and say, look, is this child uh, your citizen? But usually there is no 
it's quite difficult to, to find an answer to this. And, but there is a provision in the constitution that, that says that if you're not, which we, we interpret as if you're not, uh, there's no proof that you are a citizen of any other country within one year of your birth, then, then you should be deemed to be stateless and you should get Malaysian citizenship. And because you're born in Malaysia, that will be under the ground 1E as stated by Jasmine earlier. Right. Next we have, can we take legal action to force Home Affairs Ministry to reveal reason for rejection of citizenship application under Article 15.2 of the Federal Constitution? Jasmine? You can, but you will not have a strong ground for it because um, Article 15 sub 2 is a registration provision. And as I mentioned earlier, um, such registration provisions gives the sole discretion um, to the Ministry of Home Affairs. So they can, they have the entire discretion to choose whether they want to reveal the reasons for rejection or not, uh, entirely up to them. And if you were to bring such an action to force them to reveal those rejection, uh, uh, reasons for rejection or the guidelines, I, I doubt that you will stand a chance in court actually. Thank you, Jasmine. Next we have, JBN rejected their application for first child citizenship. What can we do? The rejection was issued a few years ago. So, uh, I'll take this. So, I think uh, if I assume, I will assume that this application is an Article 15A application uh, for the child citizenship. So, what can you do is, unfortunately, uh, I mean, you can apply again. Uh, as long as the child is below 21, you can apply again under Article 15A. So to, for citizenship and hope the JPN can reply you as soon as possible. Another thing you can do is look for a lawyer and perhaps think about applying for citizenship by operation of law under Article 14, based on if you fall under the uh, born in Malaysia ground or the born to a Malaysian parents ground. And these are the two options that you can, you can pursue. Thank you. Next, we have following up on the idle reforms which we were talking about just now, what are the temporary measures? Um, I think we've already uh, mentioned that you have either two methods. If one of it is if you fall um, under the citizenship by operation of law under section 1A to 1E, or another method is you uh, put in an application to be registered as a Malaysian citizen. So if for children under the age of 21, you put in an application under Article 15 sub 2 or Article 15A. Usually it's 15A because it, um, it doesn't require one of your parents to be a Malaysian citizen. Another, another method for you to get is, uh, for, for this is that you file an application to court uh, for a declaration of citizenship. What we have observed is that uh, if you put in an application to court, and you have an ongoing Article 15A um, application in the JPN, the government will expedite your Article 15A application before the High Court makes a decision on your application. We, will only, we can only assume that they do not want the High Court to make a decision which may declare you as a Malaysian citizen and consequently the government would need to put in an appeal against that decision. So from what we have observed, such 15 week applications are usually expedited and you don't have to wait um, for a long period of um, two years up to five years to get, um, to get uh, uh, the, your Article 50A application to be uh, rejected or approved. We'll take a few more questions, maybe two more questions. Um, next one is this one. Mother is Indonesian, father is Malaysian. Child is born out of wedlock in Indonesia and she is now one year old, not legitimized. Can a child get citizenship once she's legitimized? Okay, so for children who are born out of wedlock and out of the country, out of Malaysia, the child's citizenship usually will refer to the father. But in this situation, and as I was explaining earlier, there is this section 17 which says that uh, any illegitimate person's citizenship will refer to the mother. So, basically, if the parents are not married, 
even so the child will be following the mother's citizenship but if once they are married and legitimized then the father's citizenship kicks in again so then even if the child i think if even if the child is born out of wedlock uh, in 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 i think what, indonesia yeah i think you can still rely on the father's citizenship after the marriage of the parents we'll take this final question what if my child's article 152 application was rejected how do i ensure that my second application is not rejected jasmine so because there are no guidelines given by the JPN or the Ministry of Home Affairs as to what would help uh, or criteria, what are the criteria for such an application, it will be tough for anyone to advise on how to ensure whether your next application would be rejected or not. The best scenario would be just to put in another application which have similar grounds and will be exactly the same as your first application unless you have any other um, new evidence or documents which would be in support of your application. Some, some people speculated that such an application would be rejected multiple times is because the government wants to see whether you have that genuine intention to be a Malaysian citizen or not. So short answer is there, is no, there, there are no guidelines to ensure that your second application is not rejected. Thank you, Jasmine. Okay, we'll take We'll take last two. What if a child whose birth certificate has been revoked after a passport and IC has been issued and a child is turning 21 years old? How can this be remedied? Eric? What if a child whose birth certificate has been revoked after a passport has been issued? Well, it depends on, on what grounds the, the child's birth certificate is revoked, actually. And if you're able to, I'll still say if you can find out what, what grounds uh, it was revoked and if you can still rely on the born to a Malaysian parent ground or born in Malaysia ground. So I think you can still obtain Malaysian citizenship and you can still get the birth certificate issued, a new birth certificate issued after investigation by JPN and try to rely on that. Uh, if, but if you can't, then uh, after 21 years old, then you can re rely on the Article 15 application process, which was explained by Jasmine earlier. Thank you, Eric. Okay, final question. Can a PR application be submitted while there is a 15-2 application? Jasmine? I think the immigration, they do not accept such an application. I've heard from par parents is that when they already have an ongoing uh, citizenship application, the immigration department generally do not allow such a PR application to be submitted. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you, Jasmine and Eric, for sharing your insights and advice with us. Before we end, I have a few announcements to make. First, please join us again for our upcoming talks. Um, it's displayed before your screen. This coming Monday next week, our partner Gan Chong Chie and our associate Priscilla Chong will be speaking on wills and administration of estates followed by Introduction to Construction Education in Malaysia in Mandarin by our partner Christine Tho on Wednesday. And we'll end the week with Introduction to Farite by our partner Sarah Kambali and Associate Anis Muhammad Sohaimi on Friday. Secondly, please fill in our feedback form and tell us what you thought of our talk today. The link to the form will be posted at the chat box at your right-hand side. We appreciate your comments so that we can continue to improve our services for you in the future. Thirdly, please follow or like our social media accounts. The links will be also posted at the chat box on the right-hand side of the screen. Fourthly, if you would like to speak to our lawyers, we offer a complimentary 30-minute consultation over the telephone or over video conference. Please fill in the form on our website. The link is also posted at the right-hand side of the screen. Finally, to our guests, thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you again in our next talk. Thank you. See you.